Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast. We're up to episode 80. I'm a little bit astonished that we made it this far. Never thought this this podcast would take such a life of its own. And one of the biggest pleasures I have doing this podcast is inviting friends of mine and coming and shooting the shit. And today's guest is Richard Cohen, CMO at Dynama Group. Richard's a good friend. We've known each other for a few years and he's one of the smartest people I know. Every time I sit down and we chat, I always learn something new. We always have really good debates, really good conversations. And he really did not disappoint today. Uh, Richard, a little bit of background uh, on his career. He has over 15 years experience in e-commerce and brick and mortar retail, having specialized in fashion and consumer goods. Before then, my group, he was at Facebook, and then uh, he he started, he spent a long time of his career also at Beyond the Rack, where he was responsible for uh, growing uh, the database from 50,000 members to 15.5, and I think they generated over a billion dollars in revenue throughout the company's uh, lifespan. He's He was at the forefront of a lot of marketing and consumer facing technologies. And we dove into some of the innovations that he helped pioneer while he was at BTR. He started his career um, selling snowboards online uh, as an eBay power seller. So we spoke a lot about that. And now he's an international you know, speaker uh, on marketing, social media, and has become really one of the leading thinkers in my estimation in the space. Now at Dynamite Group, he leads marketing and e-commerce for one of uh, the largest Canadian multi-channel retailers. We spoke about how he started his career. Uh, as he says, uh, you know, he's wet behind the years selling snowboards online. Uh, the, the feeling of ownership he had when he started having success uh, selling products online. We spoke about the importance of consumer behavior and staying ahead of the trends, having a vision for the future. And then the, the dichotomy between brand and direct response. Uh, Richard, like I said, really good friend. I've learned a lot from him throughout the years and I st- that I still apply to this day. I really hope that you'll enjoy the conversation. Richard, it's good to see you, man. Good to see you too, Nectar. I'm happy to catch up in a very nice office, I have to say. You guys have a pretty nice setup here. Thank you. Um, I have one question I don't think I've ever asked you is, when did you figure out that selling snowboards online was going to be a thing? (laughs) Uh, I I figured it out after I sold my first snowboard jacket and realized that that was a thing. And then, uh, you know, went back to the guy who sold me the jacket and I was like, can I buy more stuff from you? And he's like, sure, you could buy boards and boots and bindings. And then, you know, I started there and, you know, Turn five grand into ten grand, and then I was I had the internet bug. And what year is this? Just take a step, take a step back here. Two thousand four, two thousand five. Okay, okay. Right. So like, obviously, e-commerce was nascent, but still had been around. Let's say ten years since Amazon. Yeah. And you started selling snowboards on eBay. Yeah. Um, you would drive down to Vermont to get them, or how? how would yeah. You do so, it? so how it? Uh, oh wow! At the risk of wasting everybody's time, you know, I um, I knew the distributor for Burton snowboards here in Quebec. And, um, he was having a sample sale. I went and bought one jacket from him for myself. I wanted to wear it. Uh, but sample jackets only came in size large. And, um, my girlfriend at the time, now wife told me, uh, Richard, you can't, you can't ride with that jacket. It's too big. And, you know, like a good gentleman, I said, yes, dear. And proceeded to sell it on eBay. And it was a Burton, AK2L LZ down jacket, color burgundy, cost me $235. I sold it for 450 American dollars at the time, and the exchange was about 1.3. So I kind of doubled my money in about five minutes, made like 200 and something bucks, which was way better than my almost minimum wage job at Sports Experts at the time. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I just made $200 in about you know 15 minutes. You know, that was pretty much my weekly pay. So I went back to the guy who sold me the jacket and I, I knew the inventory well because I was a snowboarder and I started cherry picking, you know, and I, I put 5,000 bucks on my own credit card on that one, in that one like afternoon, uh, put everything in my caravan, drove to my, my mom's house, put it in the basement and started listing stuff, you know, one after, one by one by one, just taking pictures of them on the floor and then, uh, 
you know, I, I grew that into, you know, being one of um, Canada's largest eBay power sellers for about five years. Um, it, it was a great stepping stone into the e-com world. Yeah. So give us a sense of this, the scope. So here, you're an eBay power seller. Like what is what is the requirement to be a power seller? Like what's the I, threshold? I think the threshold is uh, – so it was, I was – to be specific at the time, I was a platinum power seller, which meant you were doing about 100K every – uh, in revenue, gross revenue, every 90 days um, on the platform, selling internationally. So I was selling to, you know, every country in the world. And, uh, you know, Canada Post would come to the house every day and pick up the parcels that were prepared and, and you know, ready to be shipped. And I, I did that, you know, starting with just snowboards in the, you know, Q4 season, but then realized I need more good. So I started working with all of the local distributors in the fashion industry, actually, in, in Montreal. So um, the guys at Howard International, the, you know, the Pajars of the world, the Linda Siegels of the world, the J Brands, you know, all the major distributors to get to get my hands on brands. So William Rass, Joe's Jeans, um, Ed Hardy, you name it. I was getting everything I could possibly get my hands on, buy low, sell high, and I would just... You know, had a basement full of denim, and then uh, that was that was pretty much how I started. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into how you use that to get into beyond the rack. But I guess another a question related to to that skill set, right? So, uh, the, I'm trying to understand the the motivation behind it. Right? It's like there's an obvious, uh, you know, the adrenaline rush of selling something and then the obvious financial gain what what do you think with well, that aspect of of buying selling what aspect of it do you think is the one that uh, attracted you the most i think that um <clears throat> i think it's like multi-pronged the first is the concept that i knew this was gonna work like just inside me i knew them i knew the gap between you know, the wholesale price I was going to be paying and the retail price people would be prepared to pay was there. So I knew this was going to work. Uh, I definitely enjoyed the ownership concept that, you know, the, you, you only eat what you kill kind of mentality working with, you know, the customers dealing with the technology, looking for ways to become more efficient, you know, so if you could change your, your packaging strategy or you could change your, a uh, shipping strategy you would save more money and then thus make more money so the the feeling that every change you made was like 100% to the business that felt really rewarding um i think the freedom also to be the master of your own destiny was something that definitely kept me up at night and you know i would wake up in the morning 7 a.m and the first thing i would do is you know go log in see which orders happened last night and, and get to work and it, um, it's just a wonderful feeling, I think. And how much of the, let's say, the, the digital um, skill set did you have before you started? Or did you learn it really all on the fly? Oh, I knew, I knew nothing before, uh, before starting my eBay store. I was, uh, I was definitely wet behind the ears, you know. But once you start digging into it and, um, you know, realizing that if you can adjust strategy, you make more money was, you know, what fueled the perpetual learning curve where, where I was curious about if I implemented, you know, ship and click with Pitney Bowes or I integrated Canada Post and got a corporate rate or if I, you know, was able to buy the goods at an even better rate, uh, you know, and then how do you get more goods? So like the, the concept of expansion, I thought was, um, was, was, was part of the feeling of how are we going to grow this thing, you know, because there was only so much inventory available in Quebec, let's say. So I started making friends with the other reps outside of Quebec and then in the United States and just started to grow the the inbound merchandising funnel, if you will. Yeah, so you had to basically problem solve your way to the growing the business. And uh, so maybe fast forward a little bit. I think it's 2008, 2009. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you meet someone at Beyond the Rack. Explain to us how, how you landed the gig at, at Beyond the Rack. Sure. So it, it, it wouldn't be on the rack for me wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for eBay. Uh, and here's why. So I went to a trade show in New York called the Cotterie, which was a high end fashion trade show. And I was going there specifically to buy goods to sell on eBay. That was my plan. Um, I, I drove down there, um, you know, stayed in, in a buddy's apartment and just 
you know, went to, went to buy goods. And I went to one of the, the brands. I think it was not your daughter's jeans was the brand. And the, the, I explained my sales pitch of why I want to buy goods from her. And the woman looked at me and said, Oh, you're just like guilt group. And at the time, guilt group was a membership based shopping club identical to beyond the rack and beyond the rack. You know, I don't want to say copied, but had a very similar business model to the guilt group uh, world at the time. And she gave this, this woman from Not Your Daughter's Jeans, she gave me the guilt group's sales pitch manual that the guilt buyer had given to her because guilt wanted to buy their clothing as well. And um, I didn't really think anything of it at the time. I just put it in my bag. But when I got back to Montreal, like you do after every trade show, you kind of read through the literature, you prioritize where you're going to follow up and where you're not going to follow up. And, and after having read the literature about this startup e-commerce company called Guilt Group, uh, there were two women who were founders there. One of the women came from LVMH, and the other was in the marketing department at eBay and had transitioned from eBay to Guilt Group. Um, to me, that was kind of enlightening. I was like, okay, career path. Why would somebody leave eBay, my cash cow, for the last five years to go to this bizarre membership-based shopping club called Guilt Group? So I did some research uh, on this industry, and I found out that there was a small startup uh, happening in Montreal. There was only 13 people or 12 people that worked there at the time. It was not well-funded, but it was essentially a membership-based shopping club that sold designer brands at a discount. Very similar to what I was doing on eBay, except essentially its own platform. And I was like, that's that's a pretty interesting business model. And I reached out to the one of the co-founders at the time, and I ended up having a, a meeting slash interview with him. And he said, you know, you, 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 you seem like a great fit for this, this company. You, you want to work here. And, you know, long, long story short, I guess I'll, I'll spare you guys the details. You know, we, we, I was the 13th employee there and I ended up spending seven years of my life there growing the business from at the beginning, we were about 8,000 registered members to 15.5 million registered members and we when we were starting we were doing about 30 or 40 thousand dollars a month in in gross revenue and at our peak uh, i think we were doing about 15 thousand dollars a month in in revenue Fifteen thousand. Uh, uh, sorry pardon me 15 million um, <laughs> but thank you, you drop revenue to half richard thanks thanks and <laughs> yeah, no we ended up doing about 15 million uh, a month in revenue so it was a pretty big uh you know, growth curve. Uh, it's 500 X. So yeah, I'd say it's, it's a bit of, bit of a growth curve. So you grew the business 500 X basically. Uh, I wouldn't say me personally, but I was but, definitely there for the ride and, yeah. uh, and, and played a, played a good part on the marketing team. Yeah. What do you think is the, the, the biggest lesson you take away from, you know, that, that crazy roller coaster? We won't get into the details, you know, of the ups and downs. There's quite a bit of ups, quite a bit of downs, but uh, I'd love from, from someone that's lived it really from the early days what what you think is the the most useful thing you took away it's the journey not the destination <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think that um you know from a business point of view i obviously matured hugely while working there um if there's one thing that i i i learned the you know that is the most valuable it's a deep understanding of your customer's behavior uh, a deep understanding of your your customer personas and how those personas may or may not change over the life cycle of your business and and how those personas change based on decisions you make while running the business. I think um, while we paid a close attention to it at the business, we didn't pay enough attention to it. And and that's definitely something that I hold very dear to me. And I, I think about it, you know, certainly in this role in this company, and it's something that I try to share with other other businesses that while sales might be up or down on any given month when you look at year on year comp, the key is having that deep understanding of your customer personas and those those customers uh, behaviors specifically correlated to what you are doing to the business, what the business is is doing to the customers that that understanding I think for me is is the denominator for success or failure in 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 any business is having that understanding. 
Yeah, I have to kind of like tip my hat to you, Richard. I've learned a bunch from you like over the years and particularly that aspect of understanding your customer is, uh, is I think a, a fundamentally important one. And I think the way that you guys were doing also back then, even though not necessarily the first ones was still very avant garde, right? So how deep you guys went to things like cohort analysis and really understanding LTV, um, I'd like to maybe just further understand how you guys went about doing such advanced analysis techniques and how you kept pushing the envelope continuously, right? So um, obviously you were looking at, at other areas, you know, looking at the barrier, looking at guilt as what you were doing, but you really pushed the envelope, particularly on things like mobile. You're some of the first ones to, you know, to do some, some really cool integration. So I'd love to pick your brain as to like your strategy that you were using back then. So certainly, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd break it up into two parts when, you know, with that question. One is the technology component and, and just letting, letting two things drive technology. One, let the data in terms of um, what conversion rate, what exit percentage, what inflection points you're seeing um, in your, your funnels, in your, in your e-com portal that, that you think you can optimize to increase ultimately the revenue per session that you're having on your site, uh, regardless of the platform, but, but taking the time to look at each one of those platforms, look at each one of those operating systems uniquely um, to find those gaps, essentially to find those, those differences between, you know, iPhone and, and iPad or different versions of the iPhone, different operating, you know, different versions of their operating system on the iPhone Um Android, you know, different Android devices, like just getting as specific as you possibly can, you know, and I, I don't want to lead people down the rabbit hole of, you know, analysis, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis, but, but you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. And the only difference between me and anybody listening and anybody out there in the world and is really in their lives is what they decide to measure. If you're going to measure, you know, cohorts, if you're going to measure, you know, site speed, whatever it is you're going to measure, that's, that then becomes your KPI and that then becomes something that you focus on optimizing. So from a technology point of view, having a deep understanding of, of the tech is important. I think having a bit of a vision in terms of the future of where the tech is going is also critical. I always used to say that um, if, if technology exists, customers already expect it. So as a business, it's important that you not read the press release, but you be in the press release. Otherwise, customers are just going to view you as a lagger to a certain degree. And and I think that that for me went with, you know, anything from mobile web to apps to push notifications to Apple Pay, whatever it was. I I didn't want to be a year behind. I wanted to be uh, as agile as possible, and in in the literal sense. And then ultimately, what that means is, from a tech point of view, adopting an agile strategy can can probably help you get there. And then the, the second prong, in terms of the data, as, as we talked about from the customer point of view, it's, it's how, how do you look at the customers? How are you tracking your customers? Are you looking at them on a cohort level? Are you looking at them on RF or RFM modeling level? Um, how, do, how do you think about your customer's lifetime value? And how do you segment them? And, and you're right, we, we were a little sophisticated, I'd say, at Beyond the Rack, but I think that there was, you know, and it, it's it's obvious, you know, there was room for us to improve, uh, room for us to go even deeper. So, you know, that then makes me think in the future, you know, do you have a churn management manager at your company? You know, you have an acquisition manager, but do you have a churn management manager, somebody who's thinking about that end of the funnel? And maybe that's everybody's job, but it's it's just the way I think about it in terms of, you know, day to day, to day is that we need to be looking at what is ailing our customers and, and focus on identifying those inflection points and improving them, you know, ruthlessly. Otherwise, we'll only look at the big wins and the excitement. We won't pay attention to the fact that there's a big hole in the bucket. Hmm. So, yeah, like the retention strategy ends up becoming paramount. Um, it goes back to your point about customer customer personas and really ruthlessly focusing on your existing customers. And you know, part of that is things like reports, like in cohorts, etc. But it goes back to kind of the strategic importance of looking at the customer. Yeah. Um, so be, uh, you left me on the rack. Uh, did a stint at Facebook, where it was I, I think it was more of a sales, uh, I guess, business development. 
uh, role where you were uh, in charge of sales for retail and e-commerce clients. So how was maybe uh, a quick point on Facebook? How was your stint there? How did you enjoy your time? I would say hats off to that company. Facebook is far none the greatest company on the planet. Uh, I, I mean it. It's the it, it is from from all aspects of it. When you think about you know, and I'm not just I, I wasn't just drinking the Kool Aid, and it was one of the main reasons why I took the job there. You know, the business does way more good than it does harm in today's world. Uh, not just from the concept of um, you know making the, the the world a smaller place and connecting people um, and and all of the amazing advantages that that has for for anybody who uses the platform but um, certainly from where I was sitting you know beyond the rack wouldn't have become beyond the rack if it wasn't for our growth acquisition strategy that we deployed through Facebook so when I look at Facebook as a business enabler to help companies grow if you leverage the tool properly and you understand your LTV and cost per acquisition of customers and so on, and you can implement aggressive acquisition strategies, you can turn marketing into a cash center, not a cost center, if, if you leverage Facebook and Instagram uh, well. And, and that, to me, means opportunity. It means that you help businesses grow. It means that they get to hire more staff. It means that, you know, they get to do right by their families and whatnot. And, and to me, that was like the most rewarding part of my role was being able to work with businesses. Uh, I worked with all, well, not all, but all, yeah, all the large uh, airlines in Canada, some of the largest tech and some of the largest retail companies in Canada. And it was a pleasure for me to be able to have the opportunity to, to walk in, work with, you know, their marketing departments and help them build more aggressive, um, you know, acquisition, retention, um, marketing strategies, essentially, that, that, that created more cash for their businesses. That, that to me, was exciting. So I, I loved that about it. The infrastructure for that company is is first class. Everything about the way you do your expenses, the way you have meetings, internal or external, uh, the leadership mark is so present, even in a company of 27, you know, now 27,000 people. When I started, there was about 14 or 15,000 people. He does a weekly all hands meeting for one hour every Friday. It's an open mic. You can ask any question you want. Uh, you know, some of them have to be voted on and so on, but essentially there is no, you know, there's no, uh, no fly zones for him. Uh, you, you can ask almost anything. And and uh, I think that fosters an amazing culture. So truly a wonderful business. Yeah, that's great to hear. Obviously, looking at it from the other side <laughs> of the other big tech company, I could, uh, there's a quite a few similarities. I, I could definitely relate. Yeah, Google. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit, actually a lot, about your current role as you know chief marketing officer at Dynamite. So move to a big uh, multi-channel retailer that's that, that's 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 growing, particularly on their e-com channel. What attracted you to the challenge? I think there were there were two things uh, that that made me want to leave my sort of IC role, uh, individual contributor role at Facebook to to being a CMO for um, you know arguably one of Canada's largest retailers. It's it's quite large here. Um, the two things were uh, one, his name is Andrew Lutfi. That's the CEO of the company, uh, a, a true visionary in in my mind, and I knew that after having just. Uh, one conversation with him and he suggested an idea and I, I won't share the idea uh, right now but it was it was something that you could do to create a more um, more alluring omni-channel experience and uh, you know in all my experience working at, at Facebook and beyond the Mac and thought I kind of I kind of thought I, I I would have heard them all he said one that was just so innovative and I was like wow like who thought of that? He's like, well, I did. I'm like, you thought of that? He's like, yeah, that's my idea. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, you're you're a special individual. You, you, he really is a visionary. I feel like every time I speak with him, he's kind of flown back from 2022 <laughs> to speak with me here in 2018. And when I, you know, when we leave, he just goes, you know, back to the future. So he was he was number one, and number two was I knew um, a little bit. You know, I knew quite intimately what this marketing department was actually doing because they were my client when I was at Facebook. So I saw tremendous opportunity to 
shift their marketing strategy and, you know, put myself back in an intro slash entrepreneurial role in this business, you know, and shift their, their, their marketing strategy quite a bit. Um, not to say that what they were doing in the past wasn't um, great. I know uh, their former CMO quite well, and I have a lot of respect for what he did. Because uh, without him, a lot of the things that I'm trying to do right now probably would have been impossible. So, you know, hats off to uh, to my, my predecessor. And then, you know, so, so those really were the two big things. The the CEO, that leader was was uh, number one, and the opportunity was, yeah. was just too great to pass up. What are the, the biggest opportunities that you see? I think it really is, uh, you know, what we touched on earlier, that that singular view of a customer, uh, particularly in, in an omni-channel environment, creating that view as a business owner and as a, um, as a, as a data scientist, I think are the, the biggest opportunities because once you unlock that view of a customer, then you can start to have visibility into their behaviors and you can start to create and adjust marketing strategies accordingly. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's funny because you're using a lot of your past experience to help kind of like take this company to, to the next level. Yep. What do you think are the biggest priorities that there are or roadblocks ahead? I think the, um, there aren't any actually, you know, if I think about it, it it's just a process, you know, I, I see it as, um, a bunch of dots that need to be connected. So it's execution, essentially. So it's yeah. like getting shit done, basically. A hundred percent. There's the, the, you know, when we were talking about this at, at Facebook and I'll, uh, you know, when, when we when we were talking about our book, uh, uh, I'm kind of flipping and flopping a bit between businesses, but when we were at Facebook, they said, you know, Rich, should we divest our efforts from retail in Canada? Should we, should we not put as much attention onto the retail industry? Is it going away? Is it, is it, you know, or retail companies in trouble. And I was like, I don't think retail companies are in trouble. I don't, I don't think retail is the issue. I think it's marketers. I think that marketers need to, need to know this in order to affect their businesses in a positive way. There's, there's the old school madmen, you know, paired market strategy that, that has legs. Uh, but that's really a plus minus on comp. I think the, the denominator these days is that Data is more valuable than oil. And if you don't understand your customer's data, you're leaving a lot of money on the table every day and sometimes to your business's detriment and, you know, or most of the time. All I'm doing here is exactly what, you know, I'm, I guess I'm blessed if I look at it in hindsight, the experience and the knowledge that the, that, that I learned at BTR has, has, has given me that concept that Brand is the byproduct of a well-run DR strategy, and it's not the other way around. And if you if you understand that and you build your marketing arsenal around your customers' data, you will be safe. You will you will get to the other end because you'll be honing in on you'll you'll be you'll be honing in on that win every day. You'll constantly be optimizing to that objective, and. That to me is is just a recipe for success. So I'm just trying to execute that here. Yeah, no, it's great. I think it, we're caught in this like kind of like like you said, this old world and new world, right? A, a lot of companies are in this world, old world where marketing is much more instinctive and and and, and gut driven. And today, it's well, it, it is all one driven by business intelligence, insights, data, um, and there is there's a, there's a how should I say the symbiosis between the two, but one is leading the other. To your point, right? Um, now we can we can kind of talk about you know how e-commerce is is driving all out of this or just connected consumers. I'd love to hear from your point of view. What do you think is the next step? Right, you mentioned you're always kind of trying to look in a little bit ahead, right? Peek down the road. What do you think is the next thing that's going to have an impact? And it's obviously going to be something technology driven, right? Not brand driven. So curious to get your thoughts. I think from a technology point of view. In terms of omni-channel retail, there's there is opportunity that is kind of staring at us. Um, when I think about the leaders in the space, I really think about Amazon. I think they are the guys who are setting the bar. Um, things like Amazon Go, you know, now to all of us, you know, it probably seems like a distant future. The concept of uh, 
being able to self check out, if you will, and what that could mean from a customer experience point of view. I, I, I don't look at that as like, oh, you know, let's watch them do it forever. I'm looking at that. I'm like, oh, let's do that now. What, what do we need to do to put ourselves in a position to make that a reality? I think about the other components of an omni channel retail environment and our, you know, ability to fulfill and uh, in terms of orders and shipping and shipping times and things like that. And, you know, I, I think about like, what's the difference between a retailer like us and Domino's Pizza, right? Domino's Pizza, you know, you call them, you say, make me a pepperoni pizza. Somebody literally takes dough, flattens it out, covers it with tomato sauce, sprinkles some cheese on it, and throws it in an oven. It takes maybe, what, seven, eight minutes for him to cook it? He puts it in a box, walks out to his car, and drives it to your house. That takes about 45 minutes. Now let's look at a retailer. You call them, or you place your order online. All they have to do is take the garment off of the rack, put it in a car, and drive it to your house. The average order value between a pizza delivery and ours, probably not that dissimilar. But for some reason, when you order from most retailers, it takes like two or, you know, let's say one to three days, you know, average to get your goods. I don't understand why we can't do that inside of one hour for anybody who's, let's say, 15 kilometers away from any one of our brick and mortar retailers. So for me, in terms of like what the future is from an omni-channel point of view, it's, it's really around, you know, and that's what I was talking about before the customer and the customer experience and how the propensity to reorder based on an experience is going to come into play. Um, and in this case, you know, to, to bring it full circle a little bit, when I was at Beyond the Rack, I used to say that if technology exists, customers already expect it. But the implication there is that somebody has already created that technology. I think in my role here as, as CMO, uh, I'm looking at it with just a little bit of a different tact. I'm looking at it in the sense that it's our jobs now to take the technology that already exists and reorder it in a way, reorder those technologies in a way that doesn't already exist to create an experience that's new to the customer and then let somebody else copy us. But I would like to be the inventor of those experiences, not the follower here. And and we're going to take cues from other businesses, whether it's Amazon or it's Domino's, and we're going to end up creating an experience here that's that's new. What are you most excited about in this, be it for Dynamite or that you've seen the space? I think the thing that gets me going in the morning, the thing that that wakes me up is is the concept that we're going to be the leader in terms of experience for customers. We're going to set the bar and other people will follow. And I think that's what excites me as, as an individual is just waking up and creating something that's special, something that customers are going to love and other businesses are going to want to emulate because that to me is the biggest compliment. Yeah. Amazing, Richard. Amazing. I don't want to keep more of your time. Um, maybe one, one or two last questions. Um, what do you think is happening in this space right now that's not garnering enough attention in your view or that's maybe misunderstood in the retail industry retail slash e-commerce i think i continue to see uh, a lack of emphasis on the mobile app ecosystem i think while it's there uh, for some reason businesses aren't necessarily embracing them to their full potential. Uh, I believe that in five to 10 years from now, the URL will go away and the app ecosystem, the native app ecosystem, whether it lives on what we know now as a a desktop device uh, or a mobile device will be our only way of interacting with businesses and brands. Why do you think it's misunderstood or, or not used to its full potential? I think probably two parts. One, people don't understand the data well enough to recognize that um, the app ecosystem creates a better user experience and, and at the crux, you know, better revenue per session than any other platform uh, available. And that's mostly because 
When you build a native app, you don't have to deal with the nuances of Safari and Chrome. You get carte blanche, which is why some of the biggest companies in the world that we can think of, whether it's Facebook or Netflix or uh, Amazon or, or, you know, you name it, Uber, uh, Airbnb, you name it, these things, uh, you know, Hopper, you, you, you know, while they have varieties of platform, their app ecosystem is extremely strong. So any any business really that offers a customer-facing portal, whether you're a gym or you're an e-commerce company, you need to go heavy on apps because I think that's where your loyalty and your engagement uh, is going to lie. Yeah, super cool, Richard. Uh, I can We can talk about this for hours, and we usually do talk about this for hours. <laughs> yeah, which I enjoy, so thank you. Uh, but you have to go back to your job. Um, I guess one last question, where can people find out more about uh, Dynamite Group or yourself? Uh, for myself, Richard Coheen, you can just check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, and Dynamite Group, you could just check out dynamitegroup.com or dynamiteclothing.com to check out uh, the business. Super cool. Thank you so much, Richard. No, thank you, Nectar. Thank you for listening to the Point of No Return podcast. Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play.